Welcome to the Proactive Adventure Health and Wellness Podcast. Today, I'm here with Dr. Joel Singer. How you Uh, doing, Joe? Pretty good. Pretty good. How about you? Nice to be here. Uh, Thanks for coming out all the way to Long Island City. No problem. Uh, Joel joined our group in 2018, um, but he was one of the very few people that I knew before he came out on a hike with us because Joel's my dentist. And we've told this story a hundred times, but... Let's just tell it again. Sure. I think uh, I read somewhere recently that when you have a memory and tell a story, uh, supposedly it keeps getting embellished. So I don't even remember the exact story other than the way I've been telling it and I guess embellishing it further as we go. But um, I was looking for people to hike with, uh, a group. I didn't like the idea of hiking alone and, you know, to meet some people who want to get outdoors and do stuff. And I fairly certain I came across proactive on Instagram, uh, looking for a local hiking, Hudson Valley, North Jersey. Uh, I sort of recognized your name, Joe Prosha. kind of rang a bell, but, and I don't know at what point exactly we looked at each other. I know I registered for an event um, without reaching out personally, and you recognized my name. I did. Um, And then I think it was finally, I don't know if I knew prior to showing up to meet up that uh, it's like, oh, we know each other. I'm your dentist. Yep. As I remember it, we were probably, on my end, I was not sure if it was you or not, Mm -hmm. but kind of expected it to be. And so when you showed up, it was a pleasant surprise. And that was back in 2018. So that was almost, yeah. It was uh, one of the inaugural members, I suppose. You, You are actually official proactive member number two. Okay. Which is pretty cool. Cool, two out of twenty something as it is right now. Very cool. And I got. I have a. Even though I know you really well, I feel like because we've had plenty of conversations. Um, I want to go back to like when you were a kid. Mm-hmm. Were you an athlete at all? You know, I was not athletic. Uh, I was probably a, a. I was a chubby kid for a lot of the years. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I, I grew up in a, a household with dysfunctional eating, and you know, even as a young kid, there was there was dieting. You know, it wasn't a matter of healthy nutrition, it was either you were you were going full all out or you were cutting back because you went full all out for too long. Uh-huh. Um, I played Little League, uh, Farm League or whatever, and then Little League like most kids did, but uh, I was not athletic. I did go to summer camp uh, most years. My mom worked full time and I went to day camp and ultimately to sleepaway camp when I was a little older. Um, so there was always there was always sports, but it was something that I was forced to do. So I... I don't think of myself as athletic. I guess when it came to organized sports, I was forced forced into some, but I always did like being in the woods, the forest. That was going to be like where I led this into. And so you kind of answered my question a little bit by like going to sleepaway camp and going to camp. That obviously had some impact on that for you, right? Yeah, I didn't I didn't have any um the only woods I hung out at was at home was one little abandoned uh, field around the corner from where I lived. That was uh, in Fairlawn, New Jersey. Uh, the back of this empty wood, this, this wooded area between two houses. It was actually on Southern Drive and it was probably the width of two small, two small postage stamp uh, properties that were all little Cape Cod houses. Uh-huh. Uh, the back of that was on Route 208. And I used to like to hang out in there. Something about being in the, in the woods. And I'm sure it Sleepaway camp at day camp and then sleepaway camp. Um, I'm sure they weren't huge wooded areas, but it still felt like you were getting out into the woods and out into nature. And I, I definitely always uh, – that always resonated with me. I always enjoyed enjoyed doing that. Yeah. And so I, as a kid, I'm sure even those small patches of woods probably looked like, you know, massive though. As a kid, you probably feel like you're out, out in the, really out in the woods, you know? Sure. If, you, I, if I went back now and walked on any one of those little trails that we used to take a little trail to the lake, I probably realized it was all of uh, 0.2 miles, perhaps. Um, but yes, as a, as a kid, it felt like you were really deep, 
Deep yeah, into exactly. the woods and away from civilization. I've had, I have that experience now because I remember like going fishing with my father and I remember as a kid like pulling up in the parking lot and then like, oh, it's such a long walk over to the lake. And I went back there not too long ago and it's like literally, you know, maybe a quarter mile, if that, you know, but it felt so long as a kid though. Well, now that you go out and walk 30 miles in a day. Well, so do you sometimes, you know? Maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe 15, maybe. So you don't consider yourself like a hiker as a kid. Like you didn't weren't a like, hiker. You just liked hanging out in the woods. Yeah, no, I liked. Uh, yeah, I liked hanging out in the woods. Uh, had to hide away to go places and do things I wasn't allowed to do, and you know, like smoke cigarettes as a twelve year old or whatever. <laughs> I got to read my mind on that one. What kind of illicit activities took place out uh -huh. there? Yeah, yeah. So when when you got into like high school and all that, or college, I guess. Like when did you start running and hiking? Because I know you did a lot of running. I guess I got away from all of that nature, I guess, beyond, beyond sleepaway camp. So by the time I was in my mid-teens, um, kind of away from that other than my only outdoors uh, uh, nature activity would have been the beach. Mm -hmm. um, but about 20, I guess in, in dental school, in my, in my early 20s, I was still a cigarette smoker for many years thereafter. But uh, I wanted to try to get a little healthier, so I started jogging. Um, and running. So in my in my early to mid twenties, when I first joined the gym, started to to run, and fitness became an important part of my life, and has ever since. Was there a particular thing that pushed you into fitness, or with a particular event? Really, just a matter of wanting to stay in shape, realizing that at uh, twenty, I don't know, twenty some odd years old, that I couldn't run up a couple of flights of stairs. Uh -huh. um, uh, friends in dental school, we friends joined uh, a local gym in Paramus. And it became, you know, an activity that I enjoyed. I watched a couple of other people that were actually starting to get a little more muscular and fit. Uh, so that, you know, that was something I looked forward to. And it was uh, the, the gym. And I started taking classes. Most, most of the guys didn't. But in the aerobics classes, fitness classes, there was also an opportunity to meet, to meet women. There you go. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. I can totally understand that. So you weren't married at the time when you started no. doing all that. No. And then when did you get married? I was... Uh, 29, 29 to 30, 1990, 91. Okay, so you had already been like running and doing your own yeah, thing there for no. a while. Did it change right. when you got married? Uh, or when you had kids, either one? You know, not really. I was, I was uh, not hiking at all at that point, but very into, very into running. I was running um, organized events, New York Roadrunners Club, Central Park, all the boroughs, uh, anything I can, you know, there were, there were plenty of, uh, at the time, I guess, nothing online, publications. Um, to find where various running events were. And I was going out most weekends at least to do a 10K or a half marathon. So I, I, oh, yeah. I left, you know, I'd leave the family early in the morning and still get that, knock that out and be home by noon or so. Yeah, okay. So that was never an issue. You have a favorite race you did back then? I did New York City Marathon several times. Yeah. I, I, then there, there were a few other local ones that I really enjoyed, the Hook, Hook Half Marathon, and we've hiked – Part of that path, in fact, that's where we walked uh, several weeks ago. Yep, not too long ago. Um, the Hook Half Marathon was always a, a favorite one. I like the uh, the various borough, the various borough ones they they did before they got very commercialized. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think in recent years I did the uh, uh, rock and roll. Uh, what is that called? Yeah, the rock and roll half marathon. I mean, they they became very commercial, but it yeah, was just it New York like Roadrunners have... Club. It was, you know, getting out and doing a Brooklyn half marathon or a Queens half marathon. I enjoyed those a lot. Uh -huh. I rem it's funny that you mentioned Hook, Hook Mountain because that was actually the first time I think we talked about you running, really. I, I had like, we probably had the discussion before, but I never really considered how much running you did in your, in your past, you know? Yeah, no, I was I, several times a week leading up to a, a longer run on the weekends, usually an organized run, you know, collected all the t-shirts and, and everything. What well, kept you coming back to do that? Uh... You know, a lot of a lot of it's the same feeling you get from hiking. Um, that even going out alone uh, in an afternoon, evening to do, a f I would run an hour, let's say five, six miles. Mm -hmm. uh, the first mile, or even a little bit longer, uh, difficulty getting a breathing pattern, um, thoughts racing through your mind. You can't shut everything off. Uh, struggling to to breathe. This knee hurts. That ankle hurts. And then. Somewhere about a mile in, you just forget all about that. The thoughts go away or they they pass by as you would hope to be in meditation. Just thought passes by without thinking about it. Absolutely uh, right. The aches and pains just 
kind of melt away. I guess the endorphins kick in and the mind kind of, while it, it wanders, but it doesn't really ruminate on anything. I liked, I liked that aspect of it probably even more than the physical. Mm-hmm. I think I'm kind of very much where you're at right now. Like, I know that feeling. I love it. And especially with the, the, the slow start when you start to think about things, then they all just fade away. Mm-hmm. We were talking before about Facebook, um, and I said I don't look as often anymore. I'm probably – I glance for at least a few minutes daily. Uh, but today or this morning, it was yesterday, um, a photo popped up from a trail run. I think it was the pain to, the pain, to pain half marathon uh, trail run that's held in – starts in New Rochelle. And there's a whole pathway of trails, uh, flatter than many of the ones we normally hike, but with rocks and roots and just no big rock scrambles. Mm -hmm. Um, And I ran that half marathon. It was seven years ago. I saw they posted on Facebook. I thought perhaps it was longer. Yeah. I had a a picture at the finish line holding my my award with with blood running down my – I my did, leg. I saw that picture. Yes, that's right. That's and right. I, I thought maybe it was longer ago because it was shortly after that that uh, it was recommended to me by a chiropractor, uh, physiatrist, and uh, maybe the orthopedist that I stop running. Now, let me. Did you go to them because you you felt some pain or something from running, or I was having some significant lower back pain, and okay. I didn't necessarily attribute it to running, but uh, imaging. I don't remember at the time if it was uh, MRIs or just X rays. Uh, showed a lot of cumulative damage from over the years, whether that was from sitting and being a dentist or mm. running or who knows what accident that might have occurred early on. But uh, I don't f- think they necessarily have all the information to turn around and say you shouldn't run anymore. But I, I took it to heart and said, look, I, I, I still want to work. I still want to be able to do things. If running is causing a problem, I don't want it to limit me in other areas. So, so I look for something else to do. So you begrudgingly you know, gave up running. Took up hiking. Took up hiking. So you were hiking before you joined our group because you joined our group in 2018, September. Uh, when did you go on your first hike? You know, I'd, I I may have done some very gentle, short hiking in the Hudson Valley area. I moved up to I moved up to West Nyack in I guess early early 2000s. Maybe around the early early two, I don't even know exactly what year about uh, about two thousand, um, and there was a lot of local trails and and but I never really did any significant hiking. Uh, we took a family vacation out to Sedona, and that might be about that might be about eight eight or so years ago, and I was very excited to to map out and plan hikes while, while we were there. I think we were there for a week and planned four or five early morning hikes. We were there in the summer and by early afternoon, even by, by noon, it gets way too hot. So plan some very early hikes. Second. Stand by. Okay. Make sure that doesn't happen again. I got to look from the producer over there. <laughs> yeah, I actually was uh, <laughs> meditating in the sauna today at the gym after my workout and about three, four minutes into my meditation, I was starting to relax and a phone call came in because I, I forgot to put my phone to sleep. I'll zap you I right out of it. listening to the <laughs> meditation through the phone and the office called and they're seeing patients today and I'm not. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, I figured, oh, I better grab this because they might need me. If you didn't hear it, it would have been fine to ignore it. I would have saw the missed call when I was <laughs> yeah, getting exactly. dressed and I would have got back to him a few It's like the after. spike out of it would have yeah. been one side or the other. I'm sorry, though, as you were saying, so it, get, okay. it gets too hot at a certain point. Today. Yeah, so I planned uh, four or five hikes for that vacation, and we went out with tons of water, and that was my first ever desert hiking, Sedona, all the Red Rock, um, and I, I loved it. I loved the, doing the mileage, the endurance, uh, the, little bit of, the little bit of climbing that I was doing there was challenging for me at the time. And you know, you know that I've been working on that challenge. Oh, yeah. Um, and I guess when I came home, I thought, hey, I, I really enjoy this hiking. And I know there's plenty of hiking around here. I just didn't. Yeah. I didn't know about the apps. I didn't know where it all was. I didn't know how to find clubs. And that's, I guess, when I probably started looking on Instagram. Did you find that, like, doing the hiking was a good replacement for the running? Did you feel like it was equivalent? Just giving you enough of that, the uh, the chemical reactions and all. Absolutely, the the difference is you can go right out your door and 
throw your sneakers on and go right out the door and run for an hour. Hiking takes a bit more preparation or a bit more planning. Oh yeah. Um, but you know, but absolutely doable and, and a nice, a nice balance of different activities and, and fitting the hiking in at least uh, once, twice a week. It's working for me. Right. Yeah. And so then you started looking on Instagram. Start- Were you looking for other people or looking for places to go? Mostly looking for other people. Um, it was actually, I, I heard uh, you interview uh, Alex who hikes with us. And he said something about, like, he said, I'm not going in the forest alone. <laughs> yeah, that's you know, right. I, I feel the same way. I don't mind going into the forest alone. But even after these, you know, these number of years and becoming, I guess, somewhat of a seasoned hiker, I still don't like to navigate or be responsible for my whereabouts. <laughs> I hate, like to, you know, I know that if I'm with a group, even if the group is lost, at least we're lost together. Absolutely. Um, so with, you know, with the apps now and looking at either all trails or, or one of the other apps to, to track where I am, at least, you know, I, I know I'm not going to get lost. Mm-hmm. My hikes alone are, are, are a few re- repetitive hikes that I, you know, that I do. And, you know, it's funny. And I know you, obviously you've been to many of the same places over and over. E- each time is completely different. Oh, yeah, for and sure. And doing the same exact hike in reverse or even an out and back the out and the back are like two completely different hikes totally totally so you can, we, they have a lot of like replay value <laughs> a lot of these places you know so even though like I, I i park on the palisades i drive from from fort lee new jersey up to up to rockland county um on the way home from work i was doing about once a week i'd like to get back to that uh, parking at one of the park area parking areas and, and doing that hike even though you're not deep in the woods um you still get that that same endorphin, that same meditative kind of feeling, even though you can hear the cars on the Palisades, you know, other than when maybe an annoying uh, motorcycle goes by or something. Yeah. And, and you can see the river, you can see the Bronx and Yonkers, uh, yet you still feel like you're still feel like you're in the woods. And even though I've done that same hike dozens of times, it's it's still it's still somewhat challenging because yeah. I control my pace and it's still you know, it's still new. The nature, you never know. There's a turkey, there's a deer. You know, this, this, it's always different. And the season's changing. And Definitely. Me and John just did the 20 miles in the Palisades, I too. Saw, I, I saw part of that. And it, you're right. It is close to the road. And, it, it, you know, you do see the, the – you see Yonkers across the river and all that. But, like, we did realize that we still got 20 miles in. So we still got the mileage. Mm-hmm. We still got the, a little bit of elevation. And just there's so much history there to look at. Like yeah. the, the old ruins. And John found a bottle – a, a glass beer bottle and he, he was like oh this looks like an old one he took it with him and then he researched it and he found like a bottle that was and i don't remember exact years or something it was it was from a brewery from the early 1900s wow and it was only open for a few years and that bottle has been sitting there at the bottom of the mountain for god knows how many years it was pretty cool that he found that though you're in there and in, in, uh even there in the palisades there's foundations uh structures you wonder if they were they estates private homes you know stairs in the middle of you know, in the middle of nowhere, it's like, yeah. where, why is this concrete here? Yep, yep, it's curb, really cool. A curb or a walkway that's half been been half buried and trails pass over it. Yep, that's some of the charm of that place. Mm-hmm. Even though it's like, you know, like I said, it's close to civilization. It's got a lot of charm to it. Yeah, no, I still enjoy it in there. So did you find anybody else before you found Proactive on Instagram? No, no, and occasionally I, I have a separate email address that I use for for junk so that my regular email doesn't get cluttered. Yeah. Uh, I don't look at it very often, but I do see that. I went out once or twice with uh, Appalachian Hiking Club um, and Hudson Valley Hikers, uh, but I, I see that if you don't plan with them, you know, way in advance, you get you get waitlisted. A lot of them come, they come up from the city and they go to places with, that that are close to train stations, mm-hmm. uh, as far as I can tell. But I went out with them, uh, some people, a couple of times, uh, and I met some people. But I always uh, I always look forward to you know when you post things. There you go. That's my preference. So September 11th, 2018, you met up with us for the first time for the, uh, we were supposed to go see the lights right, went, off a of mountain. hike, early, late it afternoon, was, yep. Late afternoon hike. I remember we tried to start a fire. We couldn't mm-hmm. get that going. Uh, and then we tried to see the beams of light from where the Freedom Tower is now, and we couldn't. So it was kind of a moot, moot point, but it was a good hike. Mm-hmm. Do you have any memories of that first hike or what your first impressions were of what you were walking into? Uh not really. I remember. I remember some of the people and some of the people that you know were there. That 
you know, that are no longer. Yeah. I yeah. see the names. Um, <laughs> it sounds like but, they all died, but they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think they're all, I think they're all alive and well. Yeah, they're yeah, all, they are. They are. And, and, and as, the, as the majority or not the majority, but all of the groups still all significantly younger than me still. But, you know, I was going to bring that up, you know, word it the right way, but you're like an inspiration to a lot of people in the group because I, I wouldn't place you like over 45, to be quite mm -hmm. honest with you. I, mean, I would I would I would hope that I can maintain this level of fitness for for quite a number of years and I do uh I do mention to to friends acquaintances patients of mine I said oh I go out with these uh I go out with these guys and girls and I hike and they're most of them are half my age so at this point maybe some of them are a little older a little a little more than half my age but not really 30 ish is is about the age it's about the median age of the group you know, and I'm 60 ish but I looked just a little while ago too, and like I realized you were one of the f very few people that had done all of the. You got all the patches, all the proactive patches, because you did all the hard hikes. Early on, I did. Early on, I did uh, pretty much something almost every weekend with you, you guys. You did. There was you a were a period of time I was pulling that backpack out and setting myself up on Friday nights or Saturday nights to get out for an early hike. You were out there a lot with us, and and you've always had that stamina, just that endurance, where you just keep going, you just keep going and keep going. A little bit slower. But, uh, but with endurance. So while I can't keep up the pace, uh, when everybody gets to stop and re rest and enjoy a, a view, a vista, you know, I get, I get there and Joel, you ready to go? In just, just a couple of seconds, I'll go right out. You just keep going. What do you attribute that to? Oh, slow and steady wins the race. <laughs> slow and steady wins the race. Huh? And I know you do yoga. I bring, yeah, you, I bring up yoga with everybody I have on this thing because I, okay. I, I, I want to get everyone's opinion on yoga. Okay. And I feel like that has a lot to do with why you're still as fit as you are. Perhaps I started I started yoga I'm I'm going to guess about about the same time, 7 8 years or so. Uh-huh. Uh, I I figured having done a lot of running and over the years getting myself tighter and tighter and tighter with minimal stretching. Mm -hmm. uh, stretching I always found to be uncomfortable. Same. And I thought that uh I think uh the yoga was always offered at the the various gyms I belong to, and the gym I belong to currently, it's uh, Vision Fitness in, in Pearl River, New York. Uh, they have a very active yoga program. I've heard uh, I've heard people say I actually have patients that are yoga instructors who said, "Oh, you do gym yoga." It's like, well, I kind of know what they mean by that. Uh huh. Uh, but at at Vision, it's not gym yoga i found it to be comparable to yoga i've done in many studios over the years it's it's yoga every yoga class is different every instructor is a little different what do they mean by that I, what's the difference i think they're referring to uh to it being more either more fitness based or yoga for the muscle heads okay maybe less um Less spiritual, less dharma talk, less okay. that aspect, the meditative aspects. The, I mean, yoga is, and I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I don't have a huge understanding, uh, but yoga is a lifestyle. It's not necessarily a one-hour fitness activity. Okay, uh, I can see that. So there is meditation, there is awareness, mindfulness, breathing. In fact, you, you had said, you asked about... Uh, fitness and running and stuff like that's very you know very important to me and i realized only in in recent years that i think a big part of that is has to do with breathing you know most of us go all day most people i suppose go all day without really thinking about taking a breath mm -hmm. and in meditation and mindfulness and yoga uh it's very the breathing is an important aspect of it in fact breathing with yoga is probably the most important part um and i think exercise endurance exercise forces you to breathe so even though you're not purposely thinking about it you're forced to get those deep breaths oh yeah and sometimes four o'clock in the afternoon i'm at a yoga class and they might say for many of you this might be your first and deepest breath of the day it's like, well, no, thankfully I started my day with a little bit of breathing because I got to get my head ready to even leave the house. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I've been telling people the whole, t like these last few years of breathing is the key to all of this. You know, I feel like if you get a control of your breathing, you could do so much more than you can if you're, if you're not aware of what you're doing, you know? And it is, not, it is funny that you say like some people have their first deep breath at, at 4 p.m. Because when you really do stop and think about it sometimes and you take that deep breath, you realize that maybe you haven't taken a deep breath, right. you know, in quite some time.
I mean, if you're out for a hike or out for a run, like I said, it, 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 you're, it's, you're forced. You don't think about it. Like yep. I said, that, that I, I really found that to be a struggle even more so with running than hiking, that that first mile, 10 minutes or so is really a struggle to get a rhythm. You're, you're, you're gasping. Your breath is choppy. You're thinking about it because you, you can't. Or, or I guess in many of the hikes, most many of the hikes seem to start up. Yeah, that's right. You know, you get out of the car, you get trailhead, and the next thing you know, you're before you even had a chance to warm up, you're going uphill. Yeah, and you're right. you're struggling. You're thinking, how the hell am I going to hike eight or twelve miles today when I'm not even a quarter mile in and I can't catch my breath? Uh huh. And then eventually that that drops away, the breath goes in by itself somehow. Mm -hmm. I like that. The the thinking, the yep. thinking stops. Absolutely. The thoughts float through, but the thinking stops. I wrote down a quote about that thinking. Put it out there. Let's read that quote. It. Lao Tzu said, stop thinking and end your problems. <laughs> Think, the... A lot of times thinking, thinking, there's another book. I didn't, I didn't uh, write any quotes out of, but uh -huh. there's another book I was reading recently that talks about, you know, that, that all of the problems are the, the thinking. You know, when you're thinking, you can, you're either thinking about the past, which you can't change. You're thinking about the future, which is somewhat uncertain. You can prepare for it, but it hasn't happened yet. Mm -hmm. And you're not present. So you're potentially missing, you're missing your whole life. I'm missing a lot. If you're not present, I know that's a hard, that's a hard thing to be. That's, um, I've been studying and reading a lot and actually took a, a, a program, we could talk about it, that I was away for a couple of week, a weekend mm -hmm. uh, in mindfulness. And the, the yoga instructor, I had to grab her at the end of the class because I wanted to write down her definition of mindfulness. She what'd said, you say? Mindfulness is paying attention to your life here and now with kindness and curiosity and then choosing your behavior. So paying attention to your life here and now with kindness and curiosity and then choosing your behavior. She said that the curiosity I know is important. The curiosity of like of a child mm -hmm. um, to remain to remain curious, but but paying attention. I mean, the, the kindness is just allowing. There's no there's no right and wrong. Um, not that I'm so philosophical. It's all I'm a student of this now. Uh, the the uh, the kindness is, I guess, like I said, there's no, there's no right and wrong. If there's, if you're thinking right or wrong, then you're already having a judgment. Yep. And if you're non, non judging and just letting, letting things be, uh, that's the, that's the, I guess the kind, the kindness part of mindfulness, mm -hmm. uh, mindful, loving awareness. It's the art of living. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff out there. A lot of too many little simple quotes on, on social media, Plenty. But le leading, leading to, you know, finding various programs and, and things that are worth, you know, worth reading and listening to. And you feel like you made some changes in your life based off of that? Changing. Changing. So you're still working on it. Yeah. Well, I, I, I would, it was pointed out to me by a, a spiritual teacher that I, that I've taken classes with and studied with and, and see occasionally over the years. Um, you know, she reminds me that, uh, that I have grown and changed a lot. And there are situations uh, in life that you face that I realize I would be facing very differently had it been years ago. Oh, so yeah. even though, you know, I find I'm, I'm, I'm very hard on myself, uh, and expect a lot of myself. I don't always stop and appreciate, you know, how much change and growth, you know, there's been. Yeah, I think you really. I think if you're not really looking at it, you you rarely realize how much has changed. You know, how much changes over the years, little by little. You know, he's a student, a student of life. Yeah, that's right. How do you feel like you've been? How long have you been kind of studied on this mindfulness journey now? Uh, I've been aware, and and exposed to. Um, I guess, spirituality, mindfulness, things related for many, many years. Uh, my ex-wife is a, is a spiritual, spiritual teacher, spiritual guide. Um, she's been involved professionally for many, many years. So I was exposed to, um, and aware of and reading and learning some, but not 
changing and not living it. And only in the recent uh, several or so years really decided to to kind of put it into action. Mm-hmm. So, any particular takeaways that you want to share? Um, I just find that that uh, a lot of it is a, a just a flow, going going with the flow, going down river, mm-hmm. not, not trying to force or, or fight things, um, letting, letting things just happen with ease and acceptance. That's, uh, that's been helping. I like that. I'm going to go back to September, 2018. Okay. So you come on a hike with us and then about two weeks later, we, you sign up for another hike and it's, breakneck ridge and you ask me are there cliffs here (laughs) are there going to be cliffs there and i say i don't think so now for anybody listening that knows breakneck ridge it is basically just a giant cliff (laughs) (laughs) and we're going down breakneck this is the first time you did it and we're going down breakneck and i remember you you had a little trepidation when you started to go down obviously you made it down uh and that was not the last time that you did that because i think after that you just kind of became much more used to it. I just wanted to talk to you basically about when you had, you had fear of that to begin with mm-hmm. and you worked on it. Um, Cause then we'll jump ahead to January, 2021 when we did the same hike, but this one was 15 miles as opposed to the, the five or six. And you went down breakneck Ridge again in mm-hmm. the dark. Um, just, can you explain to me how those feelings faded with the fear? Mm-hmm. Explain to me how the fear faded away or, you know, adjusted over those few years and why? Sure. Let me, let me preface by saying um, when, I, when I offer to bring a friend or introduce somebody to the club and ask, and, and ask them if they hike, uh, I don't like the responsibility of bringing someone along to some place that, that they weren't expecting, something different than what they expect, expected it might be. I didn't realize that hiking might include so much, I would I'd call it rock scrambling now, but back when it was new to me, I would call that like climbing, mountain yeah. climbing. I experienced that in Sedona um, where there was enough climbing that my kids at the time were teenagers and they would, they would scramble. They were ahead of me. Uh, ex-wife was behind. And I think when we got to some of the stiffer, stiff, steeper things, she decided to stay back. Um, but I would ask the kids, I'm like, I was stuck. Where do I put my, my hand or my foot? So when I, I don't know what made me ask about breakneck. I don't know if I remember, I don't remember if I looked something up or I, you know, I don't know what made me think to ask, but okay, there's no cliffs. I think about cliffs with skiing too. Is there a place where I might turn a corner and have no choice but to like <laughs> drop 20 feet or something like that? I can't do that. Yeah. So, you know, you, I guess you said, no, that's not, you know, not, there's no cliffs here. And I don't remember, I didn't actually remember that we came down breakneck. And I think now, based on some changes they made there, they, they prefer you not even go that there's so many people going up breakneck that they don't even want you coming down breakneck. Not that it's not an amusement park, amusement park. They can't necessarily make hard and fast rules. Yeah. They can't really stop you. Right. They do have a do not enter spray painted on a few rocks there okay. to not go down <laughs> yeah, I'd, see, I, I'd not, one I'd way not seen that at this point <laughs> yeah but uh no there were times there that uh that i panicked you know i looked down and you think well gee you can see i can't remember there i know you can see the the route nine whatever which highway you can see the highway or the road you can see the train i guess is on that same side yep it's like but i don't think i could tumble that far but you know you you think about where you, your next your next couple of steps. There were there were a few times I got stuck. Mm-hmm. The group got too far ahead of me, or you know, and I was hoping like someone's going to backtrack and oh Joel, you're going don't go straight down that way. You're going a hard way. Go around. Oh, that'll that'll help. I didn't see which way you guys went. Uh huh. Yeah, I didn't remember that that first time was uh, was going down. I was looking at some pictures recently of it, and I was just like, wow, yeah, we just. I think I rem- I remembered 
like right when we got to the the breakneck portion because we had gone up Bull Hill and it was right. you know gradual. And then I remembered as we were approaching that like, oh, rock scramble, I was like, ah, oh, shit, not gonna like that. <laughs> I got to break this to Joel. But then again, you did in twenty twenty one. You did it again, and I think you had less trouble, but it was in the dark. Mm-hmm. Uh, but now I don't even consider you somebody that had that. I, I don't really, you know, consider that as a, a fear of yours at this point. I still think of myself as, as as afraid of heights and apprehensive, but I, you know, I challenge myself, I force myself, and, and most often, I, you know, I realize, well, I I can do it because I've I've either done it before or I've done something more difficult. You know, I'm not concerned about not having the strength or the endurance. You know, and, and a lot of times it's just a matter of two, three steps. Mm-hmm. You know, one one thing that was pointed out to me the that really helps a lot, I remind myself, three points of contact. Yep. You know, there's no reason that I can't slot on my butt or use use a, a, a hand and have an extra. You only, you only have to move one limb at, one limb at a time. So That's only right. one of the four limbs has to leave the ground. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The, the dogs and the goats seem to have no problem scrambling right up that stuff. Goats have no problem. <laughs> the advice I gave people when, you know, fire towers and things like that, it's like, how often do you kind of get blown off of a, of a structure? Right. And so if you have those three points of contact, you'll be all right. You know, you'll, you'll, you'll live. I actually sent a, a photo of the fire tower this morning to, uh, to a woman I was speaking with who mentioned uh, a fear of heights. And she said that uh, the Eiffel Tower, the elevator in the Eiffel Tower going up, now I'm assuming – it's caged in because I'm sure they're not taking tourists up with the possibility that someone might fall or jump. Yeah. Uh, but she said she went halfway up and she panicked and they had to bring the elevator down for her. <laughs> so I sent her a picture of the fire tower, which was actually against a beautiful blue sky. We weren't on the tower. I guess I, I took a photo up at the tower. Uh, and even looking at that, knowing that, you know, I climbed those steel great steps, seeing down, looking down. Um, you know, it, it's scary sometimes, but the truth is it's, you know, it's not unsafe. You've got two railings and the stairs aren't going to cave in and give way. Yeah, exactly. You know, plenty of times on top, been on top with, you know, in the winter or in the uh, late fall with, with a lot of wind and whipping wind. But, uh, I, I, unless I was exhausted from a hike, I wouldn't turn down the opportunity to climb up it if I were there. Uh huh. And so after you did all these hikes with us then you, you did do some rock climbing. Mm-hmm. Right, you did some. Uh, where was that that you did the rock climbing at? I, I guess do they call that the traps. Yeah, over in Mohawk, right? Yeah, yeah. I did that for my 60th birthday. My kids wanted to take me rock climbing. Where, uh, where's the studio here in Queens, not Brooklyn? Oh, no, Long Island Queens. City. Okay, Queens. So yeah. in they wanted to take me uh, for my birthday rock climbing somewhere in Brooklyn in in indoor rock climbing, and they said, oh, we got a great idea for your birthday. Things you'll really will do a rock climbing, and then there's yoga class on the roof, and they have lunch there, and we could spend the day. And my suggestion was, hey, if we're going to do rock climbing, let's get a guide and do some real rock climbing. You know, and they thought maybe that was, you know, too much or whatever, you know, just too, too involved for first time out. I'd never even done any indoor rock climbing. Maybe many years ago, I did the small rock climbing wall on a cruise ship. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I said, no, let's, let's do this. And we went with an outfit in, in, in Mohonk. Uh, I found a... Uh, well, through a, through a guide company, I got a private guide for for the day for the just the three of us. Um, you know, it felt that felt well, didn't feel safe. I knew I was safe. Uh-huh. I knew I wasn't going to fall more than several feet. Um, you know, maybe you'll fall ten feet and swing and swing into the side of the cliff. Oh, that's it. But you're not going <laughs> to fall. Um, and the kids did did better than me, but I I scrambled up. Some of those walls, I got to till I got to areas that were like, I don't know what you'd call it. I call it like negative, like oh yeah, yeah, having to climb climb out, out almost like uh, like they do bouldering, yeah, trying to climb. But a couple of you know the guides like, oh, just make it over that thing and you'll be up on this ledge. I'm like, eh. <laughs> so you don't have to. I was like, mm, I'm good. I'm halfway up. That's far enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did had your kids done rock climbing before? They no, took, also only they, that was they've, their first they, time. Well, they've too. gone in. They've gone indoor. Indoor, no, never, never like that. I, so I do like that. It was your suggestion. Like, no, we're going to do some real rock climbing. Mm-hmm. So then you do that, and then when, what birthday did you jump out of a plane? Ah, that was also uh, it was a it was also a 60th birthday gift. Uh, it got postponed several times just due to weather. Uh huh. Um, so maybe it was, but shortly shortly after that, it was it was no more than a couple of years ago. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Also in the same in the same area. 
instead of, uh, I guess, New Paltz is to the right and Gardner is to the left. Yeah, that's right. The airport's right up there. Skydive the ranch. I would absolutely do that again. That was invigorating. So now you do it again because you've done it already. But when you were first told that that's what you were doing, how would you feel? I think when I first when I first got that you know gift, I opened up the gift certificate and I was like, you know, when I was told now if before I even opened it, if this is something you don't want to do, I just want you to know that it's returnable. <laughs> you know, you uh, I can get the refund. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I looked at it and it's like, no, I'm gonna I'm gonna do this. I've always spoken about possibility of doing this. Yeah, I didn't know that I would. And so you you. Decide you're gonna do it, and you were comfortable knowing you were gonna do it. You didn't have any fear of that, or yeah, no, I was excited that morning. Drove drove up there, beautiful, we had a beautiful morning. I drove up, uh, uh, the friend, girlfriend I went with. I said, uh, you know, I'd like you to do it as well. She said, well, I wasn't gonna buy the certificate for both of us. And I said, no, we're both we're both going to do this. If we're yeah. gonna, if we're gonna drive all the way up, you're not gonna just watch me. We're gonna do it together. Um, yeah, they give you you know some. Some instruction, get you set up with equipment. And you, the the videotape, I guess for for all first timers, that's a critical part, and 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 uh, to add that to the package. Oh yeah. And they interview you a little bit before you walk into the plane. You know, getting on the plane with some first timers that are jumping tandem. Uh, I don't remember about a dozen or so people on the plane, and some of them are seasoned skydivers that are just. Taking a ride, taking a ride up, uh -huh. or uh, or in or in training, where they're dive where they're diving either with someone as a coach that's diving with them or next to them. It was uh, it was it, that was a great experience. Would forty year old Joel have felt the same way about jumping out of a plane? Probably. I yeah, you if, think if, so? If like somebody would have said we're doing this, I, I think I would have. So it's sort of just having that like gone and push into it, it, kind of. It's not something you would have woken you up. Push and into it. You think you, you think someone's going to need to push you out, push you out of that plane. <laughs> I got to push you into the plane first. But no, it's uh, it's something I would definitely I would definitely do again. I think I would have I think I would have accepted that anywhere along the way. I did want to ask you about um, a little bit about your practice. Okay. Because. How long have you how long have you owned your own uh, dental practice? I've been in Fort Lee for thirty years. Uh, March March twenty third was exactly thirty years in Fort Lee. Congratulations! I graduated, thank you. I graduated dental school in in eighty seven. I did a residency for one year at Mount Sinai Hospital, and I bounced around various various jobs, a couple of different mentors I worked with, and a couple of crappy jobs uh, for several years. And I ended up settling in, uh, joining somebody and ultimately taking over in Fort Lee in 93. Wow. And now what got you into dentistry? Uh, it was just a suggestion from my mom. I was, uh, science and math were strong points in school. Um, I'm sure for you it was more reading and writing. Totally. Um, it was science and math primarily. And I was a biochem major. I didn't have a career path. And I went to the Job Opportunity Center down at, this is uh, Rutgers in New Brunswick. Uh, really only to be disappointed and find out that if I stayed in biochemistry, that would mean, you know, going to get a master's, uh, probably being one of the grad students that taught or led the chemistry lab or those kind of things. And that wasn't uh, direct uh, enough job training for me. I kind of needed, I want to know, well, well, what am I going to do for work? Mm -hmm. Not just put on a suit and start going on job interviews. I don't know. Um, so it, I think it was my junior year in college or going into junior year. I looked into chiropractic. I read somewhere that I didn't have to graduate first. I could go as a junior. Mm -hmm. um, but I'd never been to a chiropractor and I didn't know really what that entailed. I stayed, I stayed in school and I guess my senior year, maybe going into my senior year, my mom had mentioned that, uh, she worked for a CPA and many of his clients were dentists. And she said, you know, the dentists seem to have, you know, good hours. Uh, they do all right financially. She's like, you always liked to work with your hands. Uh, I wasn't an avid model builder, but I did like to build little model cars and different little arts and crafts kind of projects. So I said, oh, that, 
sounds like a good idea. And I'd been to the dentist. I knew what it kind of, I thought I knew what a dentist does. Yeah. And, uh, you know, thankfully, uh, I had, I had the aptitude and the ability to, you know, to go through the training and, uh, I enjoyed it. And so you enjoyed it, which is why you kept going. Yeah, I met a lot of nice people along the way. And I, you know, I had an aptitude, aptitude for it. Um, I enjoyed the, the people really like, I like the one-on-one time with, with people. Mm Mm-hmm. And it just uh, well, it, it worked it, out for us pretty it, well. <laughs> it blossomed and flourished, and it uh, it worked well. I, one thing that impresses me about you though is that you you do you, do you still continue your education until now? Well, or that recently at it least it changed a little bit with COVID. Uh-huh. Uh, prior to COVID, I traveled quite a bit, um, lots of weekend courses, um, always study club meetings and things like that. COVID turned everything into Zoom, like for everybody. Yeah. Um, and I didn't enjoy that as much. I liked uh, being being present at some of the larger continuing education events. You know, vendors were there. There were people in the industry uh, learning about new products and things during breaks, spending time having lunch with people. And you're a social a animal. Little, you're a social animal. a little animal. bit about what, you know, when you learn, you know, we're, we're, like, I think they call it like a cottage industry. Um, you know, solo practice is not dead yet. You know, I'm alone in my office. I don't necessarily know what my colleagues are doing or what products they use or how do they, you know, how do they do different techniques differently. Certainly now with social media and, and uh, different web forums and things, there's, there's lots of uh, opportunities for that. But I really enjoyed the on-site, on-site learning, hands-on learning. And I've done some since COVID, but not, not nearly as much. Um, combination of being maybe a little bit on the other end of my career and uh, the fact that the, the Zoom whole thing did really change that. People are realizing, hey, you know, you don't have to get on a plane or take five team members to a hotel and stay for four nights and get all kinds of expensive meals out. And as much as I enjoy that, I love that camaraderie and the bonding with the team and everything, it's, uh, it's become less necessary. Understood. I just always thought, I thought that was really impressive that you were so driven. Because even when I met you, you were still saying, oh, I got to, you know learning things to go to here and there and you you do that quite a bit always new techniques new materials new, new adding new things to the you know to the mix that you know that interested me that i didn't, hadn't known about i think that speaks a lot to you though that even you know years later 30 years in you know you're still going to to learn new things and pick well, up and now on the other end on the other end of the spectrum i i have uh dr bradley a young associate working with me in the office and i really enjoy mentoring him and uh, i look forward to being able to travel either, you know, together with, Mm -hmm. uh, introduced him to, to a number of organizations. And he's taken some courses that I'd taken in the past, um, that, you know, that I had recommended. And I look forward to, to sharing those with him. Do you have a piece of advice for someone in a leadership role, especially owning their own business that you could share? Well, I haven't always been the best leader over the years. Um, in fact, there's, there's probably a lot of leadership stuff that I've yet to learn, but I've had great relationships with everyone that's worked with me over all the years. I've been fortunate that, you know, whether it, whether it trickled down that way from the top down, or I've just been fortunate to have hired a lot of the right people. I have a lot of long-term, long-term staff. Uh, I don't even like to call it, it's my, it's not even a staff, it's my team. Mm -hmm. Um, But, but long-term members and, uh, you know, I, I truly care about all of them. They're, that's like my second family. They're, they're my friends. You know, I've had advice from, from some other people saying, you know, they're your employees, they're not your friends. I'm like, well, you know what? I don't think it's wrong for me to have them as, as friends and as family. And it's, it hasn't backfired on me yet. I think you just have to treat, treat people fairly. I'm not, uh, I'm not always the best at delegating. I tend to be a micromanager, but, but giving the people the tools and the resources and the education that they need to, to thrive in their, in their position and then let them, you know, kind of let them free to mm-hmm. do what they need to do. I'm, I'm better at that now since, uh, I'm not wanting to do everything myself anymore. Yeah. And, and that's really working for me. You know, I don't remember the last time I looked at or paid a bill, but somehow, <laughs> somehow they all get paid. Everything's getting paid. You're still open. <laughs> I don't even know how I wanted, I don't even know what I wanted to ask you about pain, honestly. Um, I guess pain management. I really didn't think this one out too far. Mm-hmm. I wrote pain on my paperwork here. I could talk a little bit about pain. Yeah. I mean, I just kind of wanted to get your gist of like witnessing people 
in both uh, a fearful mode going into something and then also like how they deal with pain, you know, as it should be happening and, and afterward. Mm -hmm. you know, it's funny, I, I treat, I, I took something from my pediatric training in dental school uh, where they taught us with treating children, tell, tell, show, do. I explain what I'm gonna do. Sometimes if appropriate, I'll show somebody what I'm gonna do and then I do it. Um, there's no tricking or fooling a kid. If I have to give a kid, you know, local anesthetic and injection, I'm not gonna lie to them. You know, I'll explain what it is. I know that I can do it so gently that they may not even know I gave them an injection. Mm -hmm. um, and I, and then I go ahead and carry out the procedure. Uh, I treat adults the same way. Most patients I see are apprehensive, they're fearful. I'm a fearful dental patient myself. Um, nobody looks forward to a dental treatment. I mean, there are some people I have that are, look forward to uh, an aggressive tooth cleaning. Some people just like that feeling, you know, like, like really, oh, get in there and dig and kind of like, it feels so like they're accomplishing something, I guess. I don't know. I, I think um, I think I can understand that. <laughs> uh, I don't know if that's just a little bit of masochism. I don't know. But um, most patients are, are fearful uh, or apprehensive. And if they don't want to portray that, I still treat them as if they are because most of the time they are. And I'll tell people, you know, you're not, you know, I don't want to take away people's uniqueness, but you're not unique. Everybody, everybody feels this way. Um, uh, I try to do every procedure I can without inflicting discomfort. Now, there's people that come in that already have pain or, you know, uh, infection or, 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 you know, or they've been in pain for quite some time uh, or woke up in the, you know, with extreme pain. Um, and it's funny, you're, when I'm treating people, I mean, I'm right in someone's space. There's an energy field around all of us, and I only think of that way occasionally, but I'm within their sphere and there are times that I actually, I feel a sensation of discomfort or I, I have to remind myself that this isn't mine. It's, it's, it's theirs. I don't have to, you know, sometimes I feel too, too vested in what I'm doing and I, mean, uh -huh. I can do my, I have to do my best and I am vested in the outcome, but you know, the procedure's not being done to me, and I've not caused the need for that procedure. Um, going back to you, you said, you know, you didn't quite know how to ask, how, or how you wanted to ask that question. Yesterday, I took a yoga class with uh, a yoga instructor is a dental hygienist, and I've known her now for probably over 20 years as a yoga instructor, and I, we talk about dentistry occasionally. And she mentioned to me yesterday that she's had the majority of her dental treatment done with no local anesthesia. Hmm. She said, I, I'd rather the dentist not talk to me because you know, I'm able to meditate and get deep enough that, um, you know, that I'm in my own safe place and they, so she's had treatment done on her that most people have to be profoundly numb yeah. to, to have done. And I have several over the years, just several patients like that. It's probably less uncomfortable for me than it is for them because they go into this zone and I'm more apprehensive about making them uncomfortable. You know, they seem to be tolerating things really well. That's amazing. Yeah, that's really that's fascinating. That's a place that people are able to, you know, my assistant sometimes, well, go to your, go to your happy place. Where do you like to be? The beach, the mountains, looking out a nice calm lake. Yeah. You know, some people can go there in their heads deeply enough that they can really just, the, you know, the pain is there. They can observe it and not you must just say all right i'm going into this and i'm going to come out the other end you know feeling however i feel that's like going into a work day <laughs> that work day sometimes i look at the schedule and i'm i'm like oh this patient's difficult that procedure's difficult that's i'm not certain what the outcome is going to be yep but one of my mentors many years said and i guess he was like a nine to six city practice he said every day six o'clock comes the day is i like the day that. is over mm -hmm. and everything got accomplished and i'm going home it's a good way to look at each day, really. Each day comes to an end like yeah. that, you know? Somehow we get through those 14, 16 mile hikes. Yeah, that's right. Do you have any books that you uh, recently read or that you want to uh, recommend? Right now I'm actually reading 
The Untethered Soul by Michael Singer. Same last name, no relation that I'm aware of. Did it have something to do with you buying um, it? <laughs> no, no. I don't remember when that was brought to my attention, and I pulled it off the shelf. I'm reading it for a second time. Um, I don't remember if I, if it was some time ago, and maybe I wasn't as ready for that book then. Um, but I'm only I'm only part way into that book. But I think that's a that's a good understanding of this mindfulness, and I think we had a little bit of a. a philosophical esoteric conversation hiking last time about the you know like who am I who is you know I'm not well versed in this enough to really speak about it much but there's that person in the background that watches everything mm -hmm. and it's like who there's a lot of things going who's who in there it's like who am I who is the I that's always there regardless of of everything else mm -hmm. um the Power of Now, another book, Eckhart, Eckhart Tolle, Eckhart Tolle. Um, I found that to be a little bit more difficult to read, and I do want to go back to that one day as well. But that's about, you know, being in the in the now. Um, also talks about, like, I don't know if he uses those words, but who who am I? Who's, yeah. Uh -huh. It's a little deep. All right, I used to say, I only read at the pool, the beach and on an airplane. Um, so that doesn't allow that much time for, for reading. Now, now I read on a daily basis, but it's all, it's either dental or self-help. Understood. Understood. That makes sense. I guess I'll generalize that whole category of self-help. The Yeah, I get that. Uh, you're a big music fan. Music's very important to me. Music is very about, important. I was thinking, of that to, thinking about that on the car, in the car on the way here. When did you dig into music? Oh, I can remember an, a vivid memory of day camp with a transistor, a transistor radio. Uh, which we probably have downstairs. And maybe <laughs> one little wire with a little tinny little earbud thing. Yep. Uh, but even AM, AM radio, Cousin Brucey calling into the radio station, wanting to hear songs. But about, I think around 12 or 13, I got my first stereo. Mm -hmm. Might have been a bar mitzvah present. And... First stereo was with uh, eight tracks for me, and Goodbye Yellow Brick Road was one of the eight tracks, one of my first eight tracks. Um, but always, always enjoyed music. By like 13 years old or so, I can remember riding my bike on, in Fairlawn on, on Broadway Route 4 to Stereo Plus. I get there, throw my bike down on the sidewalk, run inside. I can remember the one, one specific coming home from... Uh, a summer away at camp, perhaps, going to Stereo Plus, throwing my bike down, running in there to buy Bad Co. That was a, a Bad Company's maybe their first album. Mm -hmm. Picked up that album back then. Vinyl was four ninety nine, five ninety nine. Came out with my new album to go home and listen to it, and my bike was gone. Oh, <laughs> bike stolen, huh? But but I amassed a pretty good a pretty good record collection, which. Uh, I'm sad to say was was lost in a flood. Not ah, that's a shame. Not Sandy, the Halloween storm prior to Sandy. I remember that. That's where all the power went out. The for Halloween a while. storm prior to Sandy, I lost power for over a week at home, and the sump pumps went out. And it was not long before that that I had taken all my crates of records that were still stored at my parents' house, even though I owned a, you know, I owned a condo and then a home for years. Finally, my mom said one day, hey, we're going to do some work in the basement and refinish part of the basement. Can you and your brother figure out what's important here and take your stuff? So I took four or five record, you know, uh, milk crates full of records. And anyway, that was, uh, was disappointing. That's but a shame. But on a regular basis, I, you know, I had paper routes and accumulated money. And I spent a lot of that money on, on records. Even, uh, gee, I think. I think the record store in uh, in New Brunswick when I went to Rutgers was Cheap Thrills downtown. I used to go there probably weekly, buy buy records almost every week. Mm -hmm. um, and live music, I guess even back then, seventy seven. I was a probably a sophomore in high school. I saw Led Zeppelin at, at the Garden. Awesome. I went to I went to a lot of concerts starting way back starting way back then. And you still do it to this day. I could I go to live music now? Probably more than ever. It, there's a really great network of of live music playing in northern New Jersey, Hudson Valley. 
Uh, a lot of it is Grateful Dead based music that I go to now, but the the quality of the musicians is amazing. So last night I was at uh, the 76 house in Tapan, New York. They do a, 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 a get together every Monday evening called Tie Dye Monday. And the drummer puts together not a specific band, but he, he grabs members he knows are from different bands that he knows from over the years and he puts together uh, a band and last night they did um, a Neil Young song, Cortez the Killer, and I don't know, it just it hit me, it was like a religious experience. Happened to be the night of the night of the end of the holiday of Yom Kippur. Oh yeah. But for me, I think that was there was more spirituality in listening to that song than anything that I reviewed all day that that I wanted to do for my, you know, for my uh, celebration of that holiday. Uh huh. Favorite album? Tough question. Yeah, that's hard to say. You know, I never really even like Desert Island. What, Desert Island. You, that's I was just gonna throw it out there. What see, you what, see what you came Desert up Island. with. <laughs> you know, I don't even know. Maybe there's a the I don't remember. There's which, too many, right? One of the Steely Dan albums might be high up there for me. Um, the Royal Scam. There's a there's a there's a lot of there's a lot of albums, and I do miss you know not having my vinyl. Not that you need that, but I don't often listen start to finish anymore. Mm -hmm. Even even not that many years ago, you put a CD in and listen start to finish. Yeah, absolutely. Now it's uh you know, Spotify kind of putting together lists for me and exactly. whatever comes on, comes on. That's right. On a rare occasion on a long road trip or something, I'll say, you know what? I want to listen to Abbey Road, start to finish, things like that. Yep, yep. It's a whole different experience yeah. now. My daughter has been collecting some vinyl. She's very proud of her record collection. Uh -huh. I popped in the other day in, I uh, was in, in uh, the Berkshires, Western Massachusetts, in, in Great Barrington. I popped into a record store and it was exciting to be there and it was also kind of a little sad flipping through and realizing how many of those albums i had and not only that but a but like a a pristine copy of i don't know like of a led zeppelin album how's it a holy a pristine copy is like 45 dollars. yes so 45 dollars. i had hundreds and hundreds of those records and every one of mine was pristine I try not to think about it <laughs> I wouldn't repurchase them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, definitely. they sound different. If I had a turntable, it definitely sounds different. Oh, it definitely does. And I think most audiophiles would like to listen to that over electronic. But uh, yeah, I'm not going back. I'm not going backwards that way at this point. No blame. I'll you. buy her a record once in a while. Yeah, yeah. They are like even like new bands. Like if you look at the records, like thirty dollars. I thought of her when because we were up in uh, in Burlington several years ago visiting my son in school, and we walked into a record store, and I bought her. Uh, Abbey Road. And I said, you know, this is a Beatles album you have to have. Yeah, no, for sure. Right. I agree. It's one of my favorites. What do you think about weed? What do I think about weed? What do you think about weed? Been a big fan since about 12 <laughs> years old. <laughs> I don't hide. I don't necessarily hide that. And, and I know you don't. Know, that's why. Even though it, even though it doesn't, maybe it, it doesn't correlate with my professional life. I've actually never been, I've never been stoned in the office and what I do on my own time. I've always felt that, even even going way back, I always thought that alcohol creates problems, and weed really doesn't. A hundred percent. The right. worst thing I think I could see, and I can remember one of the commercials years ago for uh, for an anti drug kind of commercial, and the and the mothers yelling downstairs to the son, "When are you going to go out? When are you going to go out and get a job?" And he's sitting there in the basement doing a bong hit. He's like. <laughs> Uh, tomorrow, mom. Yeah. I mean, I mean, the worst thing that's going to happen with weed is that someone, I don't know, just becomes that lazy. I don't even know that it, I, I, you know, I don't think someone should just live their life being stoned all the time. But I've really never, I've never had an issue, an issue with it. I don't necessarily agree with all this. Uh, not that I don't, not I did that I disagree with legalization or decriminalization but i don't like the fact that you know everywhere you turn you have an opportunity to it's i i guess it's the same as alcohol the liquor stores have been there all along mm -hmm. people people kind of will will settle into a routine or whatever oh for sure you benefits from it it just seems too readily available 
I think I sleep a little better. It's, it's, it relaxes me occasionally. Um, you know, and I, and I probably, I, I always say that I, I use cannabis because it's a lot of it's edible now too. Um, in high frequency, low quantity, low quantity. I don't, I don't do a, a lot. I don't use a lot, but on a pretty regular basis. Mm -hmm. And I always have since, like I said, since my, since my teens, and maybe you gravitate toward people, you know, when you have a common interest, but most, most people I do, most people I know do it somewhat regularly. Yeah, same. I think the only people I know that don't are people that just didn't enjoy it because otherwise it's uh, nobody I would know have any kind of, has any kind of moral issue with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just wanted to see how you felt about that. Um, all right, we're going to get wrapping it up soon here. But um, like I said to you before, how old are you? 62. Just turned 62. And, and I wouldn't even think of you as over 40, to be quite honest with you. I think you, that too until I look in the mirror. <laughs> yeah, but that's, you know, the way you look is... And the, even, by looking, even by looking in the mirror. I know I, I, when I compare myself to... Like I said, I mentioned Facebook. You know, you see peers, you see people you went to school with, and yeah. you know, you realize that you no, know, the average person doesn't have a fitness activity they do every day. The average person, you know, I, you know, I, I kind of I set the bar kind of high for for people. I tend to be, still be judgmental. I think people should do something most days. I agree, um, but I know that I know that people don't, and I know that most sixty year olds aren't going to get out with you guys and 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 hike sixteen miles. Yeah, well, you're a testament to like staying in shape and, and but being they can come fit. out on the social hikes and they can go out and do five or six. We do yeah. a nice relaxed pace. It's fun. It gets you out there. Good sell. Some of them, <laughs> you know, some of them are going to aspire toward you know, toward doing more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but you've been like a you know, you're up on a pedestal because you've done so much with us. Um, what do you have a, any piece of advice you would give this to yourself at age 25, at age 62? Hmm, that's a good question. I know that I'll not have that opportunity again, but uh, just imagine. You know, there are well, there are things I would rec you know that I, you know, say to my my children, I guess, who are twenty five ish. My daughter's twenty seven. My son's twenty twenty two, twenty three. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I like them to to maintain a fit and healthy lifestyle. Everything in moderation. Um, I think lifestyle and balance are important. I don't want to see my children, and I know that they're not going to become workaholics. Um, you know, I'd like them to have a nice, a nice balance in their lives. You know, going out and killing yourself just to, 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 to try to make a whole lot of money is not, is not building and making a life. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I know that they have, they both have, you know, uh, pleasurable pursuits, travel, you know, my son is an avid snowboarder. There are a lot of things that, that they enjoy doing, and I, I think it's important to put as much emphasis on, on that, you know, in relationships with people as there is, you know, on a career or work. Mm -hmm. That's one, uh, one piece of advice. I think reading is very important, and I don't, like I said, I read now almost every day, a little. But, um, you know, if people were to read, I think I saw a statistic or a quote the other day, if you read 20 pages every day, you know, you'd be reading a book every couple of weeks. You'd be reading 20 or 30 books a year. Yeah. Um, he said all the, all the really successful people read a lot. He said Warren Buffett reads six to eight hours a day. He can afford to. He can afford to. <laughs> That's the thing right there. <laughs> and do you have uh, – what are your goals in your life right now? You know, I think really the, the only goals I still have for myself, I really I, – I, I look forward to, you know – watching my children's life progress, you know, no, no pressure on them, but I look forward to, I look forward to grandchildren one day. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm so, I hate to say disappointed, but I'm, I'm disappointed that I haven't seen a lot of the world yet. And I do want to travel. Um, you know, I've not taken, um, consecutive weeks off in many, many years, um, being in solo practice, you know, I always felt like, you know, trying to like bookend the two weekends plus a week is like 10 days. Um, but I would like to, I'd like to take some more extended, extended time to travel, uh, and see the world. Do you have anywhere in particular you want to see? 
Well, right now, thinking in terms of active pursuits, I, I've been seeing a lot of, a lot of really nice uh, uh, natural environments and things I like to see in, in Switzerland okay. and Iceland. I have a neighbor that uh, has family in Iceland, and she travels there a lot, and she sends me pictures from hikes with lava flows and, like, really, really cool stuff. And I've seen some great stuff in Switzerland. Um, I don't necessarily need to walk through all the ancient churches and all of those kind of things when I go places, but to to see the natural environment, to have the foods and the, and the culture. Food is as important to me as music. Ah, uh, I get that. So, and I, you know, we the have greatest things in life. We live, you know, living in, in North Jersey and, and near, you know, near the five boroughs we you can eat just about anything and everything. And I, I enjoy, I enjoy finding these unique little home of all kind of places. You have a favorite place? Um, I keep throwing these favorite questions yeah. at you. Like it's, I know it's hard to identify yeah. one of anything. <laughs> no, but I know that if people say my favorite cuisine, I would, yeah. I would, Put a big umbrella over that and say Asian, which I, which I would include uh, Vietnamese and and Thai and, and and a lot of the unique, you know, not your basic not your basic uh, neighborhood Chinese, but more some unique unique things uh -huh. Indian Thai Vietnamese, and I and I have some little hole in the wall places that I enjoy for each of those. So I've asked everybody on the show this question: Is there a piece of equipment? that you would recommend to people or that you feel like helps you on your hikes or outdoor exploits? One thing I'm actually surprised that more, and yourself included, um, more of the avid hikers, I really love the, I guess that's a, that's a brand name, but Camelback. Mm -hmm. I like having my water right there. I sip water throughout, throughout the hike. Um, I probably drink ultimately more water than a lot of people. I know that I've heard some of the you know, some of the hikers say, well, if your water bladder breaks, then you have no water. Well, I guess I could have one additional bottle of water or something with me, but I like that convenience of having the, the, uh, the water and, and shoes are very important. Personally, I, even when it's, even when it's a long distance, even when it's warm out, I like my ankles protected. I like high top hiking, hiking boots. I don't know. They're not, they're not ultra light and they're not like trail running sneakers that's just my my preference i've found that i keep going back to those do you have a brand of shoe that you wear currently have a pair of uh that i really really like is i think they're oboes o-b-o-z okay that was uh i got a gift from the 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 women in my office bought me a gift for the holidays last year uh they were a pair of really good keen hiking shoes and just the the fit wasn't just quite right and i went back to rei where they bought them and uh, a woman there happened to be you know, really knowledgeable. She looked at my foot, we tried a couple of different sizes on. She said, try these instead. And I put those oboes on and they felt like, even though it's a heavier, stiffer shoe, it, it felt like they were mine right from day one. Um, there was a guy on, I don't know where you might want to use this, uh, but there was a guy that uh, had, uh, it was either an interview or podcast about longevity. Mm -hmm. And he said that anything that you can do at 60, you should be able to do it 80. And it's counterintuitive that activities that one would think they should stop doing as they get older are some of the ones that are most important. And he said that the most important thing in aging is leg strength. He said that if, if by age, I don't know the ex quote exactly, the, the statistic, but by age 70 something, if you didn't die from cancer or heart disease, your next likely cause of death would be a complication due to a fall, probably a broken hip and a complication due to rec recuperating from a broken hip. Yeah. He said that your, your femur, strongest, largest, strongest bone in your body and probably the largest source of minerals, your mineral bank, um, is really critical. And, you know, you're going to keep that bone strong by doing resistance exercise. So your leg strength... I think he said leg strength, agility, and mobility are the three most important things. And the three activities that they said that most older people wouldn't think to take up or certainly or might stop doing is skateboarding. I'm, I'm not a skateboarder. I'm not going to start skateboarding now. Uh -huh. um, surfing and skiing. 
Hmm. And hiking is actually pretty high up on the list. Yeah. Because you're using leg strength, you know, balanced. You're using your, you don't think of it that way, but you're using your, your brain a lot. Your brain is processing all the uneven terrain that you're on. Oh, yeah. But just to, you know, just to put that out there that, you know, some people think older, they want to just be, be safe. I'll put out, I'll, I'll say it's, you know, I know people my age that already start thinking towards, you know, maybe my next uh, residence, I should be living on one level. I mean, I'm, I'm not thinking I got to stop using stairs before I'm 80 or 90. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't plan for that. I can't imagine no, you would be somebody who would. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to ask you about five hikes and just give me your memories of what you remember from them. You know that my memories aren't that good. I always ask you, Joe, have I been here before? <laughs> the parking lot looks familiar. I know that. <laughs> um, so we're just going to just, just read, you know, whatever you got in your okay. mind. So September 11th, 2018, High Mountain, your first hike with us. Okay. I, re I remember that was the, the, the September 11th thing, and it was uh, a social event, which sometimes, and, and certainly more so then than now, but socializing with new people could be awkward for me. Mm -hmm. And really the not never having been on any kind of a organized hike, not the not the not knowing. Um, but I, I remember I, uh, you know, I enjoyed that hike, even though the, the destination wasn't exactly what we had anticipated, mm -hmm. you know. Then September 30th, 2018 was that first time you went to breakneck. Yeah, that was uh, parts of that I, I, I know were were terrifying, but a really, a really uh, nice sense of accomplishment for me. Uh, May 18th, 2019. That was Stillman's Assault. That was when we did that 18 miles. A big group was there. Do you remember that day? Vaguely. I have a hard time remembering which were the, which were the long ones, but uh, also, again, a, a, nice, a nice sense of accomplishment to, to, you know, those dawn till, dawn till dusk kind of hikes, really getting a lot of, mi a lot of mileage in. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Do you remember September 12th, 2020, camping trip and then Adirondacks, Giant Mountain? I remember the camping. You remember the camping? Yeah, I always say I'm never going to go camping again. <laughs> I think that was probably attributed to us kind of. No, I thought the camping wasn't. <laughs> I, 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 I had borrowed gear and it was a, it was a comfortable evening. It was a comfortable um, evening. We weren't, I think we weren't allowed uh, campfires where we were. No fires. Uh, so we really didn't. You know, I was thinking it really would be nice to cook and have a meal together and everything, but we brought sandwiches and whatever and got in the, got in the tent. And I remember in the middle of the night, you know, wanting to get up to relieve myself and it was cold. <laughs> we got up in the morning and it was cold and, you know, a couple of, I, I remember uh, one of the women had some type of canned, canned co iced coffee for herself and it's like, oh, coffee would have been Coffee would have been a good idea. Um, I don't. I don't remember the hike. I know we went the night before because a, a long Adirondacks hike with the, you know adding, and the drive and everything. Oh yeah. And I, I decided then that I wouldn't go camping again. <laughs> it's one takeaway but from always, it. But I, you know, but certainly enjoy the company and enjoy the hiking. And the last one I wanted to ask you about, we talked about it a little earlier, January seventeenth, twenty twenty one. That was the Beacon Bully that we finished in the dark. You know, I, 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 the first thing that comes to mind when I think about that hike is, and I ask you his name every time because I can't remember. Luis. Luis, but the other, the other one, he and his wife were attorneys. They moved from Brook, Brooklyn up to Beacon. Oh, that was Jeff. The, they, Jeff and Luis both kind of hung back with me toward the end. Uh, we didn't anticipate it getting dark out. And, you know, ultimately I took my headlamp out and thankfully, you know, had the, had the headlamp with me. Um, but maybe mile 13, 14, I guess, knowing that it was getting late, knowing that I was tired, each step started to feel like a jolt through my hip and my lower back, both sides. And I was very scared about that and apprehensive and everyone was getting ahead of me. Um, and they, they took turns or looped back to, to stay with me coming down. And I was really, really grateful for that. And again, got down to the road in the dark and it was, that was a real nice sense of accomplishment. Oh yeah, definitely. I remember the end of that one too. I remember feeling very proud of the whole group for kind of finishing that whole day off. It was a good day. It was a good day. I, I do look, you know, I do look forward to more more days like that. Oh, they'll be. I, I still wanna. I'm not. I'm not done pushing myself. I know that. Word association.
I'm not much of a game player, but we'll see how I do. Just see what you say. I, I, I'll always cut it up anyway, so. All right. Apprehension. Breakneck. Commitment. Endurance, distance. Skydiving. Exhilarating. Fear. False evidence appearing real. Ah. Contentment. Ease. Yoga. Peace. Breakneck. <laughs> you know, we'll go back to apprehension. <laughs> They'll, they'll but accompl be. accomplishment is nice too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wisdom. One day. <laughs> Teeth. I don't know. I had a love hate <laughs> relationship with teeth these days. Um. I don't know. Teeth are teeth are vital. Vital. Music. Uh, music is life. I thought you were going to say that. Meditation. Calm. Education. Hmm. Lifelong. Endurance. Hmm, I don't want to say important, but endurance is important to me. Um... I don't know. Important might be the yeah, answer. Then. Important. <laughs> it's important to me. Uh, three more. Drive. Commitment. Mountains. Nature. Peaceful. And hiking. Kind of like music. Hiking is life. I like that. Joel, thank you so much for coming out here today. This has been a real good time. This was awesome. Professional podcast. Yeah, you like you like I it. I huh? like it a lot. It's a good setup, and and we're gonna keep this going. Excellent. So find us at Proactive AHW on Instagram and Facebook. I'm Joe. That's Joel. That's Jared. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Thanks for being here. <laughs>